Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon to all the alumni from different regions joining us today. Uh, I welcome you to our very first webinar, which is part of a series of webinars uh, to, to handle questions and educate our alumni on different challenges which we all face daily. Um, I'm here with my team from Nasty and Alumni, uh, Nasty and USA team from Nasty Alumni team. Uh, and I have Dr. Umar Kadri, who is our guest today, uh, to answer some questions and also educate us through a very important topic, which is stress management. Uh, so Dr. Umar Kadri is a psychiatrist who has been in the US and practicing for about 27 years. Um, he has been generous enough to give us the, his precious time today. Um, he is a certified diplomat of the American Board of the Psychiatry and Neurology. Um, and his areas of interest include management of anxiety um, and depression and promotion of general well-being. Uh, he's a resident of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, he has been married to his school sweetheart for about 37 years. Uh, he has two sons who are also physicians. And he has one grandson who is 10 months old. Um, in his free time, he enjoys music. He sings as well. Um, and he does photography. Um, and, and just for the alumni and all the people who are watching and listening to us today, uh, we did uh, receive some questions, which we will be, um, which Dr. Kadri is going to answer uh, towards the, during this session. Uh, but feel free to share your questions um, and we will be collecting them and we will be having further sessions after this one to uh, give you answers and also explain you uh, with your concerns and questions. Uh, off to Dr. Umar Kadri. Um, please start your session. Thank you so much again for giving your time to us today. You are muted. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Off right. to you now. Well, thank you, Aisha. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, thank you for your very nice introduction. Um, so what I'll do is I'll initially give a brief primer on uh, stress and uh, anxiety, and then we can uh, take the questions after that. So in terms of defining stress, it's a very broad term, but generally speaking, stress is anything that takes us out of our comfort zone. So think of it as any challenge that needs to be overcome. Uh, it can be something that we are not familiar with. Uh, it can be something related to our job, our finances, our relationships, anything that uh, presents itself as uh, an obstacle or a hurdle that we need to overcome. It can be a threat uh, perceived to self, which may be our physical safety. It could be our emotional well being that is threatened. Uh, for example, in the context of a relationship, financial stability, even threats to our social status or our uh, job security. So stress can come from, from a number of different sources. The general emotional response that we have to stress is one of anxiety. We feel uh, nervous. We have a feeling of apprehension. Uh, and those are some of the hallmarks of uh, stress. Um, but why do we have this emotional response to stress, which is anxiety and apprehension? Uh, it actually has its usefulness uh, and it is pathological and it is abnormal only when it is excessive, overwhelming or of long duration. Uh, so in terms of its evolutionary origins, uh, we have stress because it propels us to action it gives us a survival advantage. So uh, when we perceive for our ancestors some 50, 100,000 years ago, uh, when they were walking in the savannas of Africa, if they perceived a rustle of uh, uh, grass or, or leaves and, and they, they felt that there was a threat, it could be a tiger or, or whatever, um, then they had to prepare uh, to uh, escape, to survive. And survival is important because if we don't live long enough, we don't get to pass on our genes. And, and basically we 
die out as a species. So stress causes a stimulation of a part of the brain called amygdala. It causes us to experience anxiety and fear. And we respond to that with fright, uh, flight, or a fight reaction. In order to fight or flight, we release a certain, so that's the external uh, presentation, but the internal, what happens to our body, body inside? So when we are uh, presented with the stress, our body releases certain hormones uh, in order to prepare for, for that fight and flight. And we have um, cortisol, uh, which is a hormone, it's called the stress hormone. Uh, there's another one called adrenaline. And then there are certain other changes that take place. So essentially our blood pressure goes up. That makes sure that uh, we are ready for the fight. Uh, blood is getting to our brain and to our heart and all the internal organs. And, and we get flushed with glucose. So cortisol increases our blood sugar levels. And that sugar is used in the short term to fuel the muscles to run or to fight. Uh, the adrenaline causes the blood vessels in our skin to constrict so that blood is basically re uh, channel to our internal org organs that we want to preserve. And the fight reaction, if we sustain any injuries, then we that vasoconstriction, we call that vasoconstriction, blood vessels constrict to divert blood flow away, then we don't bleed out very quickly. So those are some of the reasons we have these reactions. So these are physiological reactions. They have a survival purpose, but we don't live in the savannas anymore. So we have, uh, our lives have evolved to where our stresses often are not acute. Acute means short term. They tend to be chronic. And that means we have stresses that are prolonged. In that context, it becomes a problem because while that sugar that's used for fuel in the short term is good, if we have high blood sugar sustained over long periods of time, it will set us up to get diabetes. If we have adrenaline constantly at an elevated level, then that high blood pressure will uh, turn into hypertension. Additionally, we, we know that stress causes damage to certain parts of the brain and to our DNA. So in the brain, uh, there's a part which is called the hippocampus. And that's a part of the brain that's responsible for our functional memory. That's the memory we need to do our daily tasks and uh, hold information in our brain long enough to act upon it. Uh, so hippocampus gets damaged from, from prolonged periods of cortisol elevation. And we can think of our DNA as basically the code of life. It's basically like, the, uh, like a uh, shoestring. And at the end of that shoestring, <clears throat> there are these uh, caps like we have on shoestrings. Uh, that keep the ends from fraying. Uh, so every time a cell divides and for us to live, our cells are constantly dividing and multiplying and replacing the old cells. So during this process of DNA uh, division or replication, the telomeres, those, those caps at the ends of the shoelaces, they protect our cells from uh, the DNA from getting frayed and damaged. Well, now we know for a fact that prolonged stress will cause damage to those telomeres. So in a nutshell, prolonged stress will make us age faster. So it is the opposite of the fountain of life. So, so if we don't learn to manage stress, we will start looking older faster. So, so those are some of the reasons we need to make sure that we manage stress in our lives. Um, so, now, in terms of how to deal with stress, I'll touch on several different things, but the most important things that I'll keep returning to are sleep. I think uh, having a good night's sleep, we underestimate, we think of sleep as uh, sort of an um, option or, or uh, a leisure, but it is actually a necessity. And I'll get into that um, uh, with uh, how sleep works to protect our brain and, and why it is essential. And then I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in detail about like work-life balance, what that means and, and why that is important for, for stress management. And, and then finally, we'll get into some uh, like useful tips that we can use to reduce the stress in our lives. 
and and um, and our relationships, which often can be the source of that stress. With that, uh, I will open it up to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Mr. Kadri. Uh, the first question we have is, how can we manage our work-life balance and manage stress in the fast-paced environment? Any practical tips? That's a great question. So uh, when we say fast-paced life, what we really mean is we have too much on our plate. When we have a lot to do, it will seem like we do not have enough time to do it. Uh, and, and that is what we mean by a fast-paced life. So essentially it's the same 24 hours in a day. Uh, we, uh, so we all have the same amount of time, but we have to find a way to make time. And, and that is what we will talk about. So the only way to create time within that 24 hour framework is to find a way to declutter our life. And, uh, and by that, I mean, uh, we put everything that we have in our lives, whether it is social engagements, whether it is uh, different activities, whether it is pursuits or objects or finances um, into just two bu buckets. So it's very simple. We have to think about everything in our life as is this essential? Or is this not essential? So essential things are things that we cannot live without. And that would be our family, our close friends, our livelihood, the roof on our heads, transportation, um, things of that nature. These are essentials. Uh, Non-essentials is pretty much everything else. And that can be um, too many social obligations, for example. We cannot be everywhere all the time, but if we try to be, then we'll be stressed out. Um, it can be very long working hours because we have difficulty saying no to our boss. So we keep taking on more and more responsibility. And especially if we are good workers and the bosses figure out that this guy can get the job done. So they'll keep putting more and more on your plate. And uh, so, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about assertiveness and how to say no. But it's important to uh, uh, first sort our lives into these two baskets. Uh, so obviously it's not going to happen overnight, but once we figure out what the non-essentials are, we have to take charge and then gradually start to remove those things from our life. And, um, uh, and, and that, that is what will create uh, that headspace and time to do things that are truly important. Because for us to not have stress and to be truly ha happy, we have to be able to spend time on things that, that are meaningful and enjoyable, enjoyable for us. So in terms of getting more organized uh, to create time, uh, what is helpful is to reduce the clutter. Again, we have clutter in our lives. We also have clutter in our brain. So a lot of time we are stressed out because we keep a lot of things floating around in our head in terms of, oh, I have to remember to do this and I have to remember to do that. And um, in this respect, there's a very good book uh, by a guy named David Allen, and it's uh, called Getting Things Done. And he has a very simple rule and he talks about if you have a thought and you can execute it, you can br bring it to fruition, then act upon it if it can be acted upon within the next five or 10 minutes. So just get it done. But often you'll have thoughts while you're shaving or doing something else or you're driving the car and, and, and you cannot act upon that thought or it's going to take longer than 10 or 15 minutes. In that instance, it is very important to immediately get it out of your head. So your head gets decluttered. So we have to have a medium next to us. These days we all have phones. We can quickly create a, a, a memo or a task or a voice memo uh, to record that thought. So now it is out of our head and it is not cluttering our mind. So it reduces the stress. 
So then at the end of the day, we collect all of those things. And before we go to sleep, it's important to organize them for our next day. So one way to get control of our lives is to put everything out of our head into a medium that we can trust that is easily retrievable. And um, uh, in that sense, I, I would recommend calendars rather than, than task lists because tasks never get done. Uh, because they are, uh, you're not holding what, yourself responsible in terms of when it will get done. So it is important to put everything that needs to get done into a calendar. So kind of make appointment with yourself that this is what needs to do, get done and this is when I'm going to do it. So calendars are better than task managers. Then when your day starts, when you wake up the next morning and you can actually visually see that this is what I will do, this is my leisure time, this is my work time, and you have assigned times to them. It's very, very empowering. And whenever you feel empowered, it reduces the sense of being overwhelmed. And, and, and being able to visually see one's day as, as it will unfold, uh, it, it really, uh, it seems like a small thing, but it really reduces the stress. So, so that's what I, I would suggest. And then if you wanna add time anywhere, it is best added at the beginning of the day. So people tend to work late. Actually, our most optimum output is when we have just woken up. So adding half a, and waking up a half an hour earlier would, would work a lot better than, than trying to work late when our brain is already tired and we're essentially just flogging a dead horse. Does that make sense? Yes, it's a great detail of the answer. <laughs> uh, the second question we have is how should we deal with the external uncontrollable stress factors like economic uncertainty and global conflicts? Again, uh, very pertinent to the times we live in. Um, so everything again, um, uh, in terms of making those binary decisions, essential versus non-essential, in this instance, everything falls into actionable versus non-actionable. So actionable things are those that are within our control, where we have the power to actually change the outcome. So that's what we are not talking about, because in that instance, we know what to do. That's what we are organizational skills are for, and we will execute the actions that will get the job done and then that stress will be gone. But a lot of what we uh, deal with in our lives is just not in our control. Uh, in that situation, uh, we have a feeling of powerlessness and that generates anxiety. It can also uh, create a feeling of learned helplessness which can lead to sadness and depression and, and often anger uh, because we feel things that are happening, we can not change them and we feel, we feel angry. In those instances, uh, there's a, a concept in dialectical behavior therapy. It's called uh, uh, radical acceptance. Radical acceptance means an open and honest acknowledgement that I do not have any ability to control the outcome in this instance. So you actually embrace the fact that things are as they are and they are beyond my capacity to change. This does not mean you have to like it. For example, if someone has lost a dear one, some, someone has passed away, a person that person will go through a period of grieving but if they do not come to terms with the fact that this loss has occurred and they keep dwelling into it and keep thinking about it they will not be able to move on so radical acceptance is things are as they are based on everything that has led up to them and i cannot change it so once people actually do this, and there are exercises to do it, there are exercises in mindfulness, et cetera, 
uh, that that can be used to do to reach this point of radical acceptance, then a person can move on. And in terms of all the like economic issues, political issues, and global issues, they usually fall into this category where we don't have to like the things that we're that are going on. But if, in order to move on with our own lives, uh, we have to uh, accept things as they are. Not, not like them. And people often get stuck on this thing. Well, I don't like it, so how can I accept it? Well, it means that you're accepting the reality, not what's going on, but the reality of how life is, how, how things are. That's what one is trying to accept and essentially coming to terms with it. And then in terms of all the stuff that goes on in the world, we are the final arbiters of what gets into our brain. So we control what we put into our brains. So we have a lot of control in that area. We don't control what's happening, but we control what we take in. So that's where limiting social media and exposure to news comes in. So, so my advice on that is uh, like <laughs> to minimize it. Obviously some degree of social media uh, is uh, essential. That's how we connect with our friends, our family members. We share our happy memories with them. So that is essential, but uh, we can limit the amount of time we spend on it. And when I was talking about uh, planning our next day before we go to sleep, we can actually put in half an hour for news and social media, and then kind of try to stick with that and then move the Facebook app and the Instagram app and all those apps either off the phone. So we do these things on a laptop. So we are forced to not we are forced not to access them so we are removing the access or i am not that brave yet so what i've done is i've kind of moved my facebook and my instagram to the last page on my phone and i have nested them inside a folder so that when i open my phone they're not staring for at me to click on them and then uh, I actually have to make an active effort to scroll to the last page and get to them. Uh, when, I, when I'm doing better, I'll actually, for some day, actually delete it from the phone and then just use my laptop for that purpose. But, but we, can, we have that control to, uh, to remove these things. When we catch ourselves drifting in the direction of these thoughts towards which we feel powerless, like, like the crisis in the world. Uh, what we can do is, first thing is to recognize that, okay, my mind is, is going in that direction. Once we become consciously aware of that drift, then we can use distraction and opposite to emotion action. Opposite to emotion action is I know what I was going towards is going to make me angry and sad. So what do I have in my list of things to do that actually make me feel the opposite of that? Like make me feel relaxed and happy. And that's different for different people. It could be going out for a jog or a run. It could be listening to music or watching Seinfeld or a favorite comedy show or whatever that might be. Uh, so that's called opposite to emotion action because our mind can only think of one thing and feel one emotion at a time. And, and then sometimes the best thing is to just have a quiet moment. We don't have to always be bombarding our system with, with information. Uh, sometimes it's best to just take a quiet walk or just, just to sit in the backyard with a cup of coffee or chai and, and just listen to the birds. Uh, so something, something very simple, but that is the opposite of, of, of what we were going to do. I hope, I hope that that answers your question. Those were really good tips, actually. Yes. Thank you. So, Thank you. So I will move on to the next question. And it's how do we effectively communicate with our friends and close family members about stress? And are there any ways that could kind of help us reduce stress? Uh, sure, yes. Um, uh, so in dealing with uh, all interpersonal relationships of which the most meaningful are family, friends, and sometimes co-workers, actually often co-workers, especially the boss, uh, we have to uh, 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 do three interrelated things. 
And those are managing expectations, both their expectations and our own, because it is mismatched expectations that usually result in stress and in conflict. Uh, we have to uh, recognize boundaries. And that does not mean our physical boundaries. I'm talking more about our boundaries in terms of our space, our uh, priorities, and our, and our time. And, uh, and then the third thing is uh, the most important asset that we truly have is not our car. It is not our house. It is our time. Uh, because time is finite, finite and it just moves in one direction. The day you lose is a day you don't have anymore. Uh, so, so those are the three things that become very important in terms of managing relationships. So um, with expectations, a red flag word is, word or thought is should or should not. So whenever someone else uses it, you're almost always more aware of what others say and do than what we ourselves say and do. But we should catch ourselves also using should and should not statements or thoughts. So whenever we say someone should do this or someone should do this or, or, or they should have called me and they did not or they should have wished me a happy birthday but they did not, we are putting our expectations on that person. And what is that doing? That is setting us up for disappointment. And disappointments accumulate and then they fray relationships over time. So we have to be careful with our own expectations and shoulds as well as when others put those on us. Because when others are putting those on us, they are essentially trying to uh, get us to use our time to meet their priorities and vice versa. So you're going to be truly happy and satisfied with your life when you are spending your time on your priorities. So <clears throat> this creates a conflict because we, we are social animals and, and we have these social hierarchies and it's important for us uh, to be able to socialize and, and be integrated. Uh, we have a deep need to be liked. Then in our culture, there's also a, a, an emphasis on being respectful and having good manners and being polite. So that makes it difficult for us to say no. And uh, uh, people from our culture are uh, not very good at saying no. Uh, like if you ask one of your American friends, he will very quickly say, sorry, I have something else planned. But what we do is we hedge our bets. So we'll say, yeah, maybe I'll come, uh, but I have something else going on. So let me check with my partner and and uh, because we have uh, so we are essentially saying no but not saying no uh, we are leaving this um, vague vagueness uh, that we can then later use to say i'm sorry it did not work out uh, so so we have to learn to say no without being um, perceived as rude or abrupt or arrogant so if we don't learn to say no, then we will lose control of our lives. And most important, importantly, we will lose control of our time. And, uh, if we, and then life will feel cluttered and will feel like uh, it is fast paced and, and there is too much to do. Uh, it's, there's too much to do because a lot of times you're doing things that others want us to do. And, and so we have to learn to say no. So in, in, in that sense, it is important to differentiate between an assertive communication style versus an aggressive communication style. So an aggressive communication style is, is very um, self-evident. That's when we become argumentative and we become loud or, or we um, um, start using a bad language. So obviously we don't want to do that. Uh, assertiveness is actually communicating politely uh, with a very calm tone of voice, usually with a smile on our face, but at the same time being firm. 
And by firm, I mean uh, not abrupt, but essentially communicating that my mind is made up. There isn't a, any wiggle room. And uh, so it, it means standing up for yourself, but, but in a polite way. So this is a skill that we have to acquire. Um, and we can do that. We can practice in front of a mirror so we can see what we come across like, what our facial expressions are like, uh, so that we are uh, seen as, uh, well, he knows what he wants or she knows what she wants, and, uh, but, but communicate it politely. So I, I think uh, that that could help improve our relationship because once people know that you are a person who is not going to be pushed around, they will not try the next time. Uh, we just have to uh, uh, do it in a polite way. The other thing is uh, when we are dealing with people, uh, we have to not always agree. Uh, in fact, it is uh, impossible. Uh, we have this expectation that for people to like me, I must be agreeable always. Uh, and, and that's just not factual. It is irrational and unachievable to think that all people will always think alike because we all have different genetic makeups which shape our temperaments. So our temperaments are genetically determined. We cannot change those. We can change our character. We cannot change uh, uh, our natural inclinations and likes and dislikes. There's a very strong amount of research on, on, on this that temperaments are inherited. And you can ask any parent who's had two or more kids and they'll tell you that their children were different from the time they were born and uh, they acted differently. And that's because their temperaments are different. So our temperaments are different and then we, our life experiences are different. So we arrive at the way we see the world and how we shape our priorities based on those two things, genes plus environment. And uh, so to expect that we will all always agree is just not possible. So we have to learn to be respectful in our disagreement and, and then to not drag things out. Because often what happens with family members and with friends, they're trying to get you to their point of view, you're trying to get them to your point of view, and then it turns into an argument. And so we have to uh, realize very quickly that this is not going to go anywhere pleasant. And as soon as that sense creeps in, we have to learn to segue. We have to uh, change the conversation in the direction of something that you know this person likes to talk about. So just change the subject. And if you're arguing about politics, they start talking about cricket and or start talking about their favorite movie star or something that you know will diffuse the tension that's building up and they will recognize that you're changing the subject, but they'll respect you for it. And uh, so expectation of unanimity has to go out the window. And, uh, and we just have to learn to celebrate that uh, uh, we, we, we have differences. And so we don't just agree to disagree, we actually celebrate that diversity. Thank you so much, that was a great answer. So our next question is about change. Like when we move abroad, right? We have different kinds of changes that we have to deal with. And then on top of that, there's homesickness as well, right? So what are good ways to help manage stress when it comes to constant change in our lives? That, that's an excellent question. We've all been through this. And uh, to be honest, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's very tough. And uh, Stephen Hawking, a lot. Of, I think most people in, in, in this forum would be uh, familiar with who he is. Uh, he was a very, very uh, well-recognized uh, astrophysicist, quantum physicist. He has passed on, <coughs> he had ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, paralyzed his whole body, he could barely uh, speak through a straw. And, and blink his eyes, that's all he could do. His whole body was paralyzed. And he said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. So if that guy with all the deficits that he had was able to adapt to the change in his body as he saw it wither away, uh, anyone can do it. So having said that, 
Uh, I'm not making light of it. This is uh, one of the hardest things. And first thing we have to do is give it time because uh, changing uh, your, uh, it's not just a change of the environment, it's a change of culture. Uh, it's a, a change of role expectations, what is valued, what is devalued, all of those ch things change. Uh, so in terms of homesickness, I think we are living in better times because when I came here, we had nothing but the phone call, the, the phone that was tethered to the wall and the greatest luxury was to have a long extension call. There were no wireless phones. There was no WhatsApp, no FaceTime. Uh, and, and making phone calls to Pakistan was very expensive. It used to cost $2.25 per minute. And uh, now it's free. So, so in terms of homesickness, we have these tools. We can make groups. We can FaceTime or WhatsApp with our friends. So you use, use those apps freely to keep in touch. Uh, with the loved ones and whenever the opportunity arises just just go back and and visit home but uh, in terms of adjusting here um, assimilation as we would call it uh, that is a gradual process and it requires a willingness or flexibility of mind uh, to change and uh, it requires an openness to view the world with a broader lens. Uh, so we have to, in a way, expand our mental horizons in or if, if we are going to be successful in assimilating. So what happens is when we come here, because we've grown up in a very different environment, and, and by the time we uh, come here, most of us are of an age where we have been cast into a certain mold. And so there is a template of survival that we bring with us. Now that template, template of survival was very effective in Karachi, in Lahore, in Islamabad, because everyone knew if I act this way, this other person will act that way. So um, uh, it was easy to manage in that world with that template. But when we come here, uh, those mental preconceptions do not apply outside our family and outside our circle of friends. We still get each other, but, but the larger world around us in which we have to work and function, they don't get it. So, uh, so, so we have to be willing uh, to see things differently and open our mind to uh, taking on some new skills. So assimilation requires four different things. One, the ability to retain that which we value from our culture. So we don't have to just throw out everything. Uh, we cherish a lot of things and, and, and we want to retain those. So, so retention of our values and then passing them on to our children, that's number one. The se second thing is adoption of new values that our previous culture did not have. So we, we often have this assumption that everyone has this, not just us, but everyone, no matter what you grow up with, uh, based on the accident of your birth, everyone thinks that they have the best culture and, and where they grew up, they have the best values and the best way of figuring out the world. That's just how we are. But um, uh, in Urdu, we used to call it Kumeka Mandak. And that is like, that's all you know. But when you get out of that, that world, then, then you have to open, open your eyes that there are several different ways to look at the same elephant. And they are not always mutually exclusive. Things are often complementary. And, and by acquiring those new skills, you can actually uh, uh, improve your level of functioning and uh, uh, efficiency. So reten retention of the old, adoption of the new, but also avoidance of in what's not desirable in the new culture. So for example, in, in our new environment, there's a lot of emphasis on materialism, which uh, I think has crept up crept into our society in Pakistan also, but traditionally we are uh, like more giving, more compassionate, thinking of the larger good, what's good for the family, that kind of thing. 
uh, now there's a more in this environment, especially there's a lot of emphasis on material gain and, and, and not so much on um, uh, taking care of each other, those kinds of things. In fact, it's more like keeping up with the Joneses. So if they get a Lexus, I have to get a BMW and th those kinds of things. So we don't have to adopt those things. So those are things I think we should shy away from. And then finally, we have to also be willing to relinquish or give away things that were in our old culture. So we, don't, we have to not be blind to the things that are actually not really good uh, about what we came from. And when we live in that environment, we did not see it because it was all around us. But now that we are out of that culture, for example, in dealing with young children, we, are, we tend to be very paternalistic. We are not very collaborative in how we deal with uh, children. Obviously, when a child is, is very young, you have to be very paternalistic because they absolutely are, are completely dependent on you. But I'm talking more like when kids grow up here and they become teenagers, then this attitude we have of like, uh, you'll do it because I know best, just does not work. You have to collaborate with the, with the kids and actually recognize uh, and discard the fact, you know, we think that old people always know better because they have this lived experience, they have a wisdom of the accumulated experience. Well, that's true and also not true because it's true in the sense that older people have a lot of wisdom from their experiences, but they did not live in the same world in which these kids are growing up. So these kids also have a lot to teach us. And we have to be mindful of that and listen to them. And if we listen to them and then raise concerns in a language that they understand, which is not a moralistic language. Like we say that if you do this, you'll go to heaven. If you do that, you'll go to hell. So heaven and hell are very, very far off for a kid who's not, who's just thinking about what's fun today. So, they, they learn more from uh, a language that is based on uh, immediate consequences. So we have to change the tone and not be very paternalistic. Uh, then the second thing we have to change about ourselves is, is, a, is, is a culture of misogyny. And, and we have a tendency to uh, believe in these very strong role expectations. And those are not always going to work in this environment unless you live in a silo or a ghetto type environment where everyone around you is um, is they see uh, so uh, so we have to be willing to relinquish recognize and relinquish things uh, that actually would make us better people uh, so so those are, are some of the things uh, that that can help us adjust to um, uh, coming to this new country um, then finally, yeah, in terms of socializing. So we uh, uh, always want to socialize with people who are like-minded. Uh, they are, enjoy the same foods, they enjoy the same music, the same movies. So, so that, is, that is all well and good. Uh, that's our comfort zone and we should celebrate that. Uh, but we should also make a little bit of an effort to step outside that comfort zone. And, uh, and meet people who are from other cultures and they may be our, our peers at work um, or other people that we meet from uh, like parent-teacher meetings or, or, or in schools. And I think that's important because in a way we are ambassadors for our culture. They have, to, they have certain stereotypes about us and we have certain stereotypes about them. We are very consciously aware of their stereotypes towards us uh, as Muslims and coming from a certain part of the world. But we do very little to change those stereotypes. And I think the best way to break stereotypes is to interact with people and to let them see your humanity. There is, there is no amount of lecturing and this and that that will uh, break a barrier like that, that personal interaction with someone, someone that, you, that you know as a good human being. And, 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 and then it will also break our stereotypes. Like we, we have the stereotype that uh, the West is decadent and materialistic and this and that. It's not all true. Uh, both of my daughters-in-law, my, my sons married American girls. 
um, uh, and and they've turned out to be really good girls. So in a way, I've uh, had to meet with their families and see uh, how uh, people don't fit these molds that we have in our in our minds. That that uh, so so we need to change that. Um, so that's essentially all I can think of right now on, on, on this subject. Maybe more will come to me later. That was a great answer and very detailed too. Um, our next question is about, are there any practical activities we can do to help us reduce stress or at least manage it to some extent? Certainly. So here I'll come to like more, more practical tips. So the single most important thing we can all do is to actually do nothing. And by that, I mean, go to sleep. So the best antidote for stress is, uh, is a good night's sleep. Uh, we have to uh, absolutely prioritize sleep as something that is not a leisure thing. It is an absolute necessity. Uh, when we are sleeping, our brain essentially uh, refreshes itself. So when we are working all day thinking, all of that brain activity, the electrical activity in the brain, the neurotransmitters shuttling back and forth, all of that activity generates uh, what are called free radicals, oxygen-free radicals in the brain. And these are really toxic if they stick around. When we're going to sleep, there are many, many different functions of sleep. So the brain is not really like doing nothing. It's actually busy. And it's busy in two very, very important ways. One, it's got these cells called astrocytes. They're basically like garbage trucks. So they are actively removing that junk that we have produced all throughout the day from our brain and shuttling it back out of the brain and essentially removing the stuff that's going to damage our brain if it accumulates day in and day out if we are chronically sleep deprived. Secondly, uh, we have an, a memory archiving system in our brain. So when we are dreaming, so the, those dreams are actually all mammals dream, not just us, cats and dogs dreams also. So dreaming is a process of uh, memory archival. So, uh, Everything that happens in our day, all of those experiences, they get a weighted score. So anything that is emotionally salient that makes us angry or fearful or happy, that gets an emotional tag and our brain senses that as in useful information. And then it archives it, it saves it for future reference so that if a similar situation arrives, arises in the future, then we have a jump start. We have a memory of how to deal with that situation. So memory is very, very useful. At the same time, all the useless stuff, like what I, what sandwich I had for lunch, I'm not gonna be able to remember what I had for lunch like seven days ago, unless it's the same thing every day. Uh, but if someone said something mean to me or they made a compliment that made me feel happy, I would definitely remember that. I'll not remember the meal, I'll remember the compliment. So that's how our brains work. The so sleep is very important for making good memories. These memories are useful because they give us an adaptive advantage in the future. So they are there for a purpose and because we have to remove the junk. So that's number one, sleeping well. A little bit more on that. So sleep hygiene is you gotta try to go to work at the same time every night, plus minus half an hour here and there. On the weekends, we try to do that, but whenever we, we, we tend to stay up late, but when we do that, we are essentially creating a jet lag. Uh, we get phase advanced or phase uh, uh, delayed. And it's like you are living on the West Coast, but you're going to sleep on East Coast time. And then you have to kind of catch back up on Monday, the same way as you had uh, shifted to travel time zones. So that's why it's important to go to sleep at the same time every day uh, with, with some exceptions. Then number two, our, our, our bedroom, our bed, uh, we, are, we have to train our brain that it, it is only for two things, going to sleep or intimacy. No third thing should happen in the bedroom. And if we are 
they're watching TV or playing Candy Crush, then those things are going to stimulate our brain and, and we'll miss the window and we won't be able to fall asleep. So, so none of those things, TV, all, all of that, that stuff should, should get out the window. And if we still cannot sleep, then after about half an hour, we should actually get out of the bed, go to a different room, do whatever we want to do until we feel tired again, then go, go back to bed. Uh, so, so, so sleep is very important. Then number two, for reducing stress, aerobic exercise has a lot of value. And uh, aerobic exercise, I would say, is anything that you do for 20 to 30 minutes that makes you break a sweat and elevates your heart rate by 15 or 20 beats per minute uh, and have you have your pick. Uh, and, and it's good to do several different things so you did, don't get bored. But aerobic exercise actually increases cerebral blood flow, increases blood, blood flow in the brain. Uh, it, it releases neurotropic factors uh, like BDNF, which is a brain-derived neurotropic factor. These are chemicals in the brain that cause a synthesis or uh, manufacturing of new synapses, new connections. So they make our brain more collateralized so that if some functions fail, there are other connections that will make up for that. The increased cerebral blood flow will also, uh, in, in the odd event that if we have a stroke, there are lots of side lanes uh, or, uh, for the blood to still flow through uh, if the main main road gets blocked with 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 a clot or something, so reduces uh, damage from strokes and things like that. And and we know about the release of uh, endorphins and enkephalins. These are chemicals in the brain that give a feeling of well being. So exercise is a very very good antidote to stress. We've got sleep. We've got exercise. Then we've got um, uh, time spent with friends. And by that, I mean uh, friends whose company we truly value and enjoy, uh, not just random parties, uh, because we are often too busy attending a lot of parties because either we want to get invited or because we don't know how to say no. Instead of that, we have a select group of friends and good friends are always few uh, and spend good uh, experiences with them, like go places with them, travel with them, uh, when people are dying on their deathbeds, that's what they miss the most, uh, not spending enough time with their family and, and, and good friends. Those, those are the missed opportunities that, that they miss. And collection of experiences rather than objects. That's, that's what people often say when they have six months to live. So prioritizing collection of experiences with people we love, that, that is a huge antidote. And my personal favorite, throw in travel. Uh, traveling is very important, not just because it gives you something to look forward to, but because it actually unplugs us from our daily lives. Uh, if we take a staycation, which I think are overrated, staycations are good for nothing because we are still at home and all the mundane activities of life are still around us and we don't really get to relax. Uh, so getting out of our uh, everyday life is important. Also, when we travel, we reset our priorities. So when we are traveling, uh, we are not in the weeds, so to speak, of our daily lives. We get uh, the 20,000 feet forest view of life. And when we are somewhere else, we are often forced to think about all the time I spend on this and that is really not that important. So it, it kind of resets our priorities and, and we come back feeling refreshed, rejuvenated with a new sense of where my time should really be going. So travel is very important. And uh, making sure I don't miss anything important. Uh, yeah, creating leisure time for our, ourselves. I talked about that. So we have to, again, discard the clutter, essentials versus non-essentials. Non and essentials including me time. So every day we have to have at least an hour, hour and a half, during which uh, we do nothing except what we are passionate about, uh, whether it is music or whether it is uh, photography or going for exercise, whatever it might be. And in that, 
activities or leisure activities that involve active participation are way better. You're almost out of time, but I think I'm also getting to the end. Um, uh, activities that involve active participation are way better than passive activities. So for example, watching TV is a passive activity. Even listening to music is a passive activity. Singing is an active activity. Uh, looking at pictures is a passive activity. Taking pictures is an active activity. So if you do anything that requires active participation, it is a lot more fulfilling and, and, and reduces the stress level a lot more because there's a sense of accomplishment uh, at something other than what you do every day. And uh, as opposed to that, if you're even if I'm watching the best, most favorite show on TV, after two or three episodes, I'll feel kind of sluggish and worn down. My attention will start to fray. So that's what I mean, so active activities. And then finally, mindfulness. So mindfulness exercises are exercises that focus us into the present. And uh, whenever, so humans are wired in a strange way. So we have to do these exercises for our brain, just like we train our bodies in the gym for physical fitness. We have to train our brain or our mind or thinking for mental fitness. So DBT or dialectical behavior therapy or mindfulness, this is kind of like a mental gym. And the purpose is to bring your focus or attention to the present moment that you're in. Because if you are living in the past, we are going to start thinking about regrets and what if I should have handled this situation this way or should not have done this or should not have done that. Or at that fork in my life, I should have done that instead of this. All of those things lead, lead to uh, sadness or grief or, or feeling depressed. And then if we go into the future, uh, then we create all these what if scenarios, these hypotheses, like what if this happens? What if that happens? How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with that? This is all going to clutter our mind and it is going to create mental stress over things, 90% of which will never transpire. So whenever we find our brain kind of sliding into the future or into the past, we have to use mind, mindfulness skills to bring ourselves into the present and focus in, on the fact that I am alive right now. This is the moment in which I am truly alive. The past is done, the future, there are no guarantees. What can I do to make this the most meaningful, happy, useful moment of my life? And that's, if we practice mindfulness, that there's a lot of data to support that as being highly effective at uh, reducing stress. I have a, I have a question. Um, in in connection to what you just explained. So we were getting some questions on the, on the chat and also from our different forums. So, um, so Dr. Umar, when you talk about having those two non-essentials and essential and compartmentalizing um, you know, from one task to another. So for example, if someone is challenged with, say for example, some domestic issue or some conflict at work or in some other situation, when we move from one to the next, um, what techniques you would recommend? I know you shared so much insightful stuff. Um, if you can share a couple of uh, things which someone would do to move when you move from, for example, you have conflict at home or at work, and now you're going home and you want to separate them and, and recharge yourself. A couple of things you would suggest. So if, if the conflict is uh, at work is, is with a boss or with a co-worker, and if the conflict at home is with the spouse, uh, at, at work, um, uh, we may avoid that person, or again, we may uh, segue uh, our conversation from uh, what we disagree upon, and once we know what we disagree upon, to something else that we agree upon. And, and start to build on that. And, and uh, maybe if it's the boss, uh, then do something that we know they value and which will water down the effect of what you disagree upon. 
So uh, that disagreement may not go away, but if you show them success or agreement in other areas, then they may think, uh, well, we'd agree about that thing, but we have other areas of, of agreement. So that would improve the quality of the relationship because then you're not just focusing on, um, on, on, on the, disagreeing, the disagreeing part. Now, now, to some extent, this would translate at home also, where it can be difficult if there's not much else to agree upon. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so then, then, then we are in a pickle, and uh, then we have to think about: uh, Do we really want to stay in the relationship? Uh, because um, there are many instances where, uh, first of all, no two spouses would ever agree. Uh, on the same thing. So this is that is where you have um, like you're like two circles. You you overlap on many things, but you also have these other spheres where you have your own interests. So that is where mutual respect uh, and and some degree of separation is very important. Uh, being in a relationship does not mean that you have to be together all the time. Uh, there are things you do together, and then you there are other things that you prefer to do separately. And, and neither party should resent uh, the other for needing their own time. I think it's very healthy to have that. And uh, so conflicts can arise when we think, oh, because we are married, we should do everything together or we should always be together. That's, that's just not possible. Because like I said, perfect unanimity of opinion on every issue is, is just not achievable. And, uh, uh, but if the circles don't overlap at all, then I think dissolution is the best, uh, best approach because then you are basically keeping each other miserable and uh, there is, uh, there's no common ground. So when there is common ground, then we can build on that. Does that answer? Very your helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually asking on a couple of people who, uh, who reached out and asked this question. So um, I wanted to make sure we handle this, but thank you so much. It's really insightful and helpful. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Tatir and Faik for uh, getting those questions from the alumni. And Dr. Umar, we are really thankful to you. Um, it was an insightful conversation. Um, I admit myself that some of the strategies you shared today, if you put them in practice, um, our lives are gonna get a lot better and of course, more productive. Um, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for listening to us today. Um, and we look forward to having more sessions. Um, thank you. Have a wonderful Definitely. day thank ahead. You. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. I really appreciated it and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Alafiz. Alafiz.